Amen. 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 All right, Isaiah 33, a very interesting chapter here. Look at verse number 5. It says, The Lord is exalted, for He dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. There's several things I want to point out just in these two verses. I think there's several really good, solid points here. The first thing is this last thing that we said here. We says the fear of the Lord is His treasure. The Lord values your fear of Him. God looks down and He sees in your heart if you take Him seriously, if you're afraid of His laws, if you understand that there is judgment, He respects that. He loves that. He considers it like treasure. You know, the Bible says that we are like treasure in an earthen vessel. That treasure is our soul. And you think about how God looks down and He sees the fear of Him as treasure, as a very valuable thing. And you know, that's kind of the beginning of salvation is when you begin to fear the Lord and understand that hell is real. And now we have to choose to strengthen it. As we move into 2018, and I mean, we're in such an uncertain world these days, things are getting stranger and stranger. And you know, here it says that the stability of thy times in verse 6. He says, "...in wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation." So as a Christian, in the Christian life, our life is going to be like a roller coaster. We're going to have ups and downs. And you know what God wants us to have is, is stability across all of our times. The good and the bad. He wants us to be stable in Him. And He says that we find it through wisdom and knowledge. You think about this. Wisdom and knowledge of the Lord is how we can know that we will have stability of times. And you think about how right now the world is reflecting on 2017, and they may look back and say, well, there was this, there was this great movie, this Hollywood box office film, or, or maybe they released a new car, or a new TV show, or, you know, people in the world, you know, they, they, they remember ball games, and yeah. songs, and, you know, things about the job, or, you know, school. And oh, those things are all in the flesh and they don't really, they're not really respected of God. It's not really something that we as Christians need to uphold and need to look back and just reflect upon. That's right. And hey, I'm not saying there's nothing, you know, it's okay to look at the success the Lord has provided for you, but keeping in mind it's the Lord. But when you look at the world's success and where they measure, again, TV, movies, songs, Football games. I mean, these are the things that people talk about when they get together. They're not talking about the Lord. No, and that's the reason we've had a problem last year and moving forward why we're in such a strange world. Yeah. And now, as we as Christians, as, as our church, the people right here, right now, as we reflect of 2017, and we look back and we think about the things that God has done for us, we look at this church plant. That's right. We look at the souls that have been saved we look at the trials that we've gone through. We looked at the, the learning curves about us coming together. I mean, just everything that God has given us are things... You know, we look at the doctrines that are learned. As Christians, you ought to be looking back and saying, you know what, this year I learned a little bit more about Calvinism. I know a little bit more about baptism. I know some more verses to defend eternal yeah. security and faith alone for salvation. I'm growing. Yeah. These are things that we should be able to look back and, and, and just you know thank God for. Yes. And I want to challenge you as a church, I want to challenge you as individuals to consider making goals as we move forward into the next year. As we look back and we say, what have I accomplished this past year? There are many things that may have just happened that weren't really goals, but I would ask you, how many goals did you have that you actually accomplished? How many things did you set forth and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to build this, you know, obviously if the Lord will bless it, if the Lord will, and you were able to accomplish those goals. As a church, I mean, we had a goal of seeing 500 salvations in Jacksonville, Florida. We've already exceeded that goal. Amen. So, Amen. hey, praise the Lord. We can look back on 2017 and say this church has been successful in certain ways. Yeah. But now we also need to be serious and look forward right. to the other times. We need stability through the times. As the times go up and down, we need to be stable. We need to be sure. We need to be standing. And we need to consider that God says here that we need wisdom and knowledge to be able to have this stability moving forward. You know, the Christian life, it's not you're not like a bottle rocket, right? You're not like a ping pong ball just bouncing off of everything. Oh, I randomly came into something. No, we should have purpose. We should have drive. We should have goals. And we need to, we need to consider these things before the Lord. 
We don't need to make things too great for ourselves. We don't need to be over much righteousness. But I think it's a responsible thing for us to make goals looking forward. And when we have good days or bad days, whether it's easy or difficult, we'll be able to maintain and just say, well, you know what? Today was a rough day, but it's okay. My family's alive. The God has blessed me. I got to read the Bible today. Yeah. You know, I can pray for a friend. You know, why am I down? Why should I consider this such a terrible day? So we need to, we need to have... You know, some keys, I think, out of the Bible we're going to look at this morning. These keys about how to maintain stability and understand the times. Because frankly, the world does not understand the time. They don't know what's going on. They don't understand. All they know is what they're being fed. And if they want to talk about a hurricane, that's all people will talk about for a month. If all they talk about is how somebody fumbled a ball... That's all they're going to talk about for a month. I mean, that's, that's the world we live in. Yeah. And we as Christians need to be separate from that. Amen. We need to recognize that those things don't even matter. It's all going to burn one day. Yeah, so right. what are we doing now? What are we doing moving forward? That's good. You know, in First Chronicles 12, he says, And of the children of Issachar, which were the men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren or at their commandment. It says of all the tribes, it's going through numbering the tribes, and it says of this tribe, these men understand the times. They know what's going on. They're aware. They're awake. And you know what it says? Their brethren were at their commandment. Okay? Having the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord puts you in a position of leadership. It puts you in a position of authority. And other people in your family may mock you or scoff you, but there's going to come a day where they come to you as an authority... Hey, whoa. Well, tell me, what does God say about this? Hey, I'm having an issue. What, what does this mean? Help me understand this. And as Bible-believing Christians with goals to get stronger in the Word and goals to become better soul winners and preachers, you know, we need to consider this, that the world doesn't have understanding of the times. That we do. God has given us a picture and an understanding of what's going on out there and why things are the, the way they are. So using that, God will put people at our commandment. Yet even other Christians in other churches may not under... Well, why are you guys going so winning? Why are you knocking on doors and preaching the Gospel? My church, we, we, we go tracting. We hand out flyers. I don't even know what, what verses do you go to. Think about this. The men with the understanding of the times will lead those without understanding. This is God's method. You know, and we have... You know, this entire nation just looked at a few because they knew what to do. They understood the times. They knew what was going on. And in 2018, we need Christians to wake up. We need to teach other Christians that they need to preach the Gospel. They need to learn doctrine. And you know, as we go out soul winning, and I've said it before, I think there's like a threefold purpose in soul winning. Number one, obviously the goal is to get somebody saved. Number two is, is to get them discipled. And number three would be as a witness against them. Those that reject the Lord one day, what you preach to them at the door may be held against them. But that second purpose of discipleship is a major goal that I have for this church. I want to see people from Jacksonville, Florida that that have not been part of an IFB movement, that maybe weren't raised Baptist, but want to know God and want to get serious about God. I want to see these people get a desire for discipleship. And I really believe that this is a goal that we should all have because we have an understanding of the time. We know God. We know the Scripture. We need to share it with them. We need to, hey, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Amen. And I think that as 2018, this should be one of our goals, is while we're out soul winning, when you find a Christian, when you find somebody that you're sure they're saved, you can't talk them out of their salvation just by continuing to ask questions. You need to, you need to tell them, well, look, I am here to invite you to my church. I want you to get out of that dead church you're in. They're not doing anything for God. Yeah. right? Putting tracks on doors doesn't accomplish anything. And most churches don't even do that. Yeah. Just sitting and having a country club doesn't please God. Right. Building a bigger building doesn't please God. Amen. We're here for the Great Commission. We're here to preach the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you find a Christian out at the door, you need to provoke them unto love and to good works. Good. You need to step on their toes a little bit. You need to rattle their cage and let them know they're in a cage, that they're in bondage by the church they're in because yeah. it's comfortable, it's convenient, and you need to tell them they need to get on fire for God. They need to learn to give the Gospel. That's, right. That's a Christian duty and a responsibility. And God, God may not be blessing them in other ways because they've forsaken this and He's giving you an opportunity to help them get that blessing back. Now to understand the times... First, we have to understand God. Look at verse 5 here. Isaiah 33, 5, it says, The Lord is exalted, for He dwelleth on high. 
He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. You know God loves right judging? You understand that God loves judgment when it's right? Yeah. Do you know that these are attributes of the Lord God Almighty? If you look up the word right and judge or righteous and judgment, you're going to find verse after verse after verse about God. And about how one day He will judge the earth. About how one day we will all stand before Him in righteousness, in judgment, and many people will be ashamed. Many Christians will have nothing. I mean, they're, all they're going to say, well, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. And you look back at this past year that, we've just, that we're, we're finishing up, we're wrapping up today, and are, there are things that we all probably would say, you know, I'm sorry, Lord. There's that thing. There's these things. There's this issue. I'm working on it, Lord. I'm sorry. But the, the question is, are you saying I'm sorry? Or are you saying, well, it's no big deal. It's under the blood. It, it's just grace. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to keep on going the way I'm going. Or do you want to honestly and sincerely humbly come to God and say, I'm sorry for the things that I messed up. I'm sorry for the opportunities where I failed. I want to be better in 2018. This is the attitude that we ought to have. Look, and this is the characteristic of God is judgment and righteousness. In 1 Corinthians, he says that there was a shame that no one in the church could even judge. The church was full of fornication and nobody would judge. Oh, they're so loving. They're just a liberal church. Everybody's welcome. You know, hey, there's a church down the road and it says it on their sign. Everybody's welcome. And I've, they have a pedophile working in their little school over there. They have a pervert that works over there. Hey, everybody's welcome. Bring your kids to us. That's not the kind of church this is. Amen. We want to please the Lord, and I'm not really worried about pleasing man. I want to please God. I'm going to preach That's His right. Word. And I want you men and you women out here to consider this. Hey, it's your job to learn the Gospel. It's your job to be able to share this with your family and your friends and strangers. You need to get prepared. Look at verse 6. It says, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. You have to consider as you go through times, your times that go up and down, the days that come upon you, you want strength of salvation. You get this stability through learning wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. Can I get a man to get me something to drink, please? In Proverbs 9, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Right here in verse 6, he says, the fear of the Lord. And he has the wisdom and knowledge. And, and Proverbs 9 just says the same thing. Yeah. And many of you that have read the Proverbs know it says it over and over and over. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. There, Every person in here can use more understanding of God's holiness. Well, that's true. Every person in here can use more knowledge of the Word of God. Yeah. No one is excluded. We can all do better. And we need to remember this. We don't need to get puffed up and say, well, I've done pretty well. I learned this. I got that. I memorized this. Hey, you need to consider what you don't have, what God wants you to have. Thank you, sir. If we make it our goal in 2018 to get wisdom, if we make it our goal going into this next year to have this knowledge, to seek after the knowledge of God, God will bless us in mighty ways. We will have stabilities through the roller coaster of life. We will, we will be able to just be solid. When somebody comes and tells you some terrible news and you just, okay, well, let me talk, let me think about it, let me pray about it. Yep. Instead of just, oh no, what are we going to do? You know, instead of freaking out and losing your mind and being unstable as most people are, hey, most Christians are, we need to be stable through it all. And that comes through the fear of the Lord. We have to understand what to do. There's two areas that we, where we really see this in how we're able to increase in our wisdom and knowledge. And it's through our walk and through our talk. The Bible uses the word conversation and it means walk and talk. The word actually sort of means both. So it's what you do and what you speak of. And it starts, I believe we really must value our own time. If you don't value your time, no one else will. If, if you don't consider I have more important things to do than to listen to gossip, I have more important things to do than to stay at work and just chat with the guys about football, then you don't care about your time. You're not valuing your time. And it hit me this week, somebody was just droning on about something. I said, you know what? Excuse me, I don't have time for this. And I tried not to be rude, but it's like, you know, I've got, I've got many other things that I need to commit my time to. And when somebody just wants to blabber on about something that's pointless, we need to take control of that and say, I value my time. And obviously you don't. I'm not going to do something for free for you. I'm not going to sit and listen to your opinion when it's not biblical. I'm done. Let me walk away. 
You need to value your time or no one else will. They will take advantage of your time. This is a very important concept. Look at verse number 15. It says, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. Now I was talking about the walk and the talk. We're going to come back to this verse, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So it's talking about he that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. The things that you say should be uplifting. They should be righteous. And the way that we walk through life, when people look at us, it should be obvious that there's something different. We need to make choices for we're not distracted by the same cares of the world as everybody else, that we're focused on the things of God. In Colossians 1, it says that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. How do we walk worthy? We increase in the knowledge of God. When you put your nose in the Bible and you study something out, when you're walking through the world, you're going to see things and be like, well, that's a red flag. I'm going to stay away from that. Oh, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to see that. I don't want to be around that. I want to meditate on the things of the Lord. And to have stability in the times to come, to have stability in 2018, we have to decide to walk with God. There are many men in the Old Testament, and I could get you a list where just, and he walked with God, he walked with God, we walked with God. What did that mean? Can you imagine just walking along, talking to God, having a conversation? Hey God, how you doing? Hey, hey God, I was thinking about this. You know, and just in your mind, just in your heart, constantly walking and talking and considering the things of the Lord. This is how we ought to be because then we're not, we're not as prone to the snares of the devil. We're, we're, we're in the Spirit and God puts a hedge around us. In James 1, he says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And we're talking about to have stability in our times. Right? Well, a double-minded man is unstable. Right? Well, I, I got to go soul winning. Well, I'm going to go to the movie theater. Well, I got to go soul winning. Well, I'm going to the movie theater. Well, wait a minute. You're totally unstable. Your Saturday, it's, it's, it's a coin toss. What am I going to do? Serve the Lord or serve the world? Right? Serve the flesh or serve the Spirit? These are things we need to consider. These are decisions that we have to make. We have to decide to walk with God. In Luke 9, Jesus said unto them, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. How many, I mean, you think about that. I, I know men personally from other churches that, man, they were, they were on fire. You know, a lot of them would call them like a bottle rocket Christian. Man, they're excited. They want to do something with everything. They want to be part of this. They want to be part of that. And then they just they fizzle out. Well, what happened? Well, I, I'm playing PlayStation with my buddies. I went back to drinking with some old friends. I went back to, to doing drugs, smoking weed. Who, you know, I'm more worried about traveling and getting overtime than I am raising a family or being in church. And those people will not last. And God, and the, God says they're unstable. Yeah. And when they go through the roller coaster of life, it's like they're hit by a freight train. They don't understand where did this come from. But if you're stable with God, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're walking, your talk is right. God will give you a calmness in your spirit and an ability to handle just crazy situations, Amen. good times and bad. Amen. You're in 2 Corinthians 5. Find verse 7. It says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And this is the biggest problem. All we can do is see. It takes faith to consider what God's doing behind the scenes. Jesus said that we judge unrighteous judgments because... We judge by appearance, right? We look around, oh, well, this guy's hair is this, or this guy's suit is that, or this car over here is that, and we have no clue what's really going on in somebody's heart. How many times have you been at a door to preach the gospel to somebody, oh, well, this guy, he won't be interested. And man, he was like, I was just praying about this. Yeah. I want an answer on this. Yeah. And the flip side of the coin, oh, well, look, they got the me and my house, we'll serve the Lord plaque, and they got a cross in the yard. These people will actually listen. Go away. I don't have time for that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm a Christian. I don't go. I mean, you think about it. We judge by appearance. We judge unrighteously. And God is telling us that we need to walk by faith. All right? We're in this flesh, but we need to be in the Spirit enough to just trust the Lord for every step of the way. Our goal is when we see these problems, we have faith that God is bigger. When we see bad days, we know we can trust the Lord to get us through it. Right? Oh, man, but this mountain i got to climb. Hey, God's bigger. Right? Amen. Oh man, this big old problem I got, I don't know what to do. Hey, God is bigger. He will get you through it if you walk by faith. That's right. But if you walk by sight, you're going to fall on your face. Look at verse number 8. He says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 
He's saying, as soon as this spirit, as soon as my soul leaves this body, I'm in heaven, right? And some days it feels like, oh man, I'd rather just go now, you know? Catch me up. Let's get it over with, you know? But don't give up. Don't give up. Don't fall into this mentality of woe is me. You know, the whole, uh, the, the, what was it? In Charlie Brown, there was Linus, the guy that had the cloud fall on him. And then there was the Winnie the Pooh, he had Eeyore. Oh, man. Oh, me. You know, hey, how you doing, brother? Oh, I, I just, I don't know. You know, how about just saying if it got any better, I wouldn't be able to stand it. Amen. Right? If God blessed me anymore, I might start, you know, call myself Abraham or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? God is doing awesome things for us, but we have to take things by faith, even when it's down, even when we're having a bad day, even when we're going through problems. Look, he says in verse 9, wherefore, wherefore, right? For this reason, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Whether we're in this body or out of this body, we do these things because we want to be accepted of God. We know we're going to stand before Him. That's why we do the work. That's why we walk the walk is to please God. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in His body. According to that He hath done, whether it be good or bad. Listen, you will stand. You will be judged. Your time will come one day when you stand before the Lord. And... We don't consider this. There are people that seriously, they, they take an attitude like it doesn't say all will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. They think it's like, well, I know those guys over there are doing the work and I'm just kind of sitting back. I got my ticket in. you know. But you're still, you're going to have to answer to the Lord. Yeah. And when God says, I gave you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, wouldn't God be justified in bringing you home early? Well, obviously, if you're not going to fight my army, and you're not even going to resupply my troops, you're not even going to sweep the floor, then come on, come on home. I own your soul. Let's bring it in. You know what I mean? Wouldn't that be terrible to have to stand before God and Him say, well, what would you do? I, I built a business, and I built a hot rod, and you know, I, I built a big house. and you know, Those aren't the things that pleases God. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. How will you fare when you stand before Jesus? How will you be rewarded? How well will you be rewarded when you stand before God? It's up to you. It's the choices and decisions you make today. Look at verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Do you understand this saying? Because God is real. He is terrible. Right? God will rain up and cloud down on people. He will cast people alive into hell. God is going to torture people forever and ever in a lake of fire that reject Him. This is a terrible thing. Yes. And knowing that it's real, we persuade men. Amen. Listen, some people mock at Christianity. Some people scoff in their heart and they smirk about it. Oh, you, you believe in hell. You believe in that silly Bible. God will, will stand... I mean, they have to answer to God on that. We persuade them. And like I said, sometimes we will be a witness against them. Listen, you heard it. I showed you the Scripture. You heard it again from somebody else. And when you stand before God, you're without excuse. Where's your heart at? What do you really believe? There will be many people in that day that will just... You think about how devastated somebody would feel knowing that they rejected, but just lying to themselves. Well, I'll get through it. Well, it'll be alright. It's not real. If you don't believe in hell, you don't go there, right? That's not what the Bible says. Right, I, I tell people God doesn't believe in atheists. You know, <laughs> look at ver, you know, look at verse fifteen. It says, "And that He died for all, that they which should live, um, which live, should not henceforth live unto themselves." What He's saying here is because heaven and hell is real, and because salvation is free, and because we're called to persuade others, we should not live for ourselves. Look, that which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. Our goal should be to not be selfish in 2018 like we were in 2017. Right? There are, all of us are guilty. Every one of us are guilty of being selfish about certain things in 2017. Yeah. And in 2018, I want to walk with God. Amen. I want God to reveal the things to me that I, don't even, that I don't even fully get it yet where I've been messing up. I don't even fully see the big picture about how serious it can be. How there can be a ripple effect affecting other people. And I, I want to ask Him to see things His way. 
And I would challenge you to have this same goal. Is God, show me, show me things in a spiritual light. Yeah. Help me to walk by faith. Help me to have spiritual eyes. Open my eyes to my own problems first. Yeah. Right? It's not God, I want to be the judge. I want to judge everybody in this. You give me, let me see what they're... No, God, show me my problems. Amen. Let me deal with my problems. Let me get serious about my problems. We all have problems. Yeah, and we, we all have a choice what we're going to do with them. And, and sometimes we kind of put it in the back of our mind and ignore it. But we should have a goal to have these things revealed to us and get them right. In verse 17, look at this. He says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, this is your choice. He's not saying, hey, you're saved. You're perfect now. Hey, you're saved. You're going to stop sinning. What he's saying is, God's given you the power. Yeah. Hey, your spirit, your soul is spotless before the Lord, right? It's sealed unto the day of redemption. No matter what sin you do, God's not going to hold it against you in the sense of taking away your salvation. But, as a believer, as a son of God, you ought to act like a son. Otherwise, He's going to whoop up on you. That's right. That's right. He's going to get your attention. And old things are passed away. How many of us are making the wrong choices and not letting those old things pass away? Uh -oh. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, how many men, and I don't think we have a problem with it in here, but how many grown men sit around and play video games? That's an old thing. Let it pass away. Yeah, right. right? Oh, but you know what? I got this one TV show. I just, I like the character. It just, I really, no, let it pass away. Yeah. Let it go. Amen. Your old friends that refuse to go to church with you, your old friends that don't want to walk with God, they're going to drag you down. Yes, Listen, everybody does one of two things. They either drag you down, or they pull you up. Now, I want to be the kind of friend that I want to pull you up. Right? But please, try not to be that guy that's pulling me down. You know? I'm not going to the bar with you. I'm not going to, smoke. I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to watch basketball. I'm not going to do any... You know, I don't want to do old things. I want those old things to go so far away that I become a new creature. I become... All things become new in my life. And it's not that hard. It's funny. We had a serviceman in our house the other day. He was like, We're, there's no TV? Like... How do you guys not have a TV? You know, and I've seen this many like people can't comprehend somebody not watching TV. People ask, "You watch it? No, I don't watch it. I don't know. Have you seen such and such show? Nope. You don't know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. I don't care to know either. Please don't tell me. I don't want to hear it. You know, I don't have time for it. My time is more valuable than television. Are you trying to let all things become new? This should be the goal. Try ask God. Show, God, show me the things that I'm not letting become new that I'm trying to hold on to the old. Because some of us have crossed the line with God where it's like, okay, I've given you, I've given you, I've given you, now I need something back. God's saying, I've given you the resources, I've given you the armor, I've given you the war. Now, now go fight. Get in the battle. And you're still just kind of standing there holding the armor. Well, what am I going to do? Yeah. Am I going to fight? Holding the Word of God. Holding that sword. Well, I've got it. You going to share it with somebody? You going to give it to somebody? You going to open it up and boldly proclaim the Gospel? Amen. This is what we've been called to do. In Hebrews 12, he says, Wherefore, seeing, we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We need to take these weights. There are things in our life that are weighing us down. And that goes for everybody. We need to find them. We need to discover them. And we need to deal with it. Look at verse 18 here in 2 Corinthians 5. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Turn to Romans chapter 13. God is saying if you're saved, He has given you a ministry. You understand that? If, if, if you don't lead the music and you just sit there and listen, that doesn't mean you don't have a ministry. God is saying if you're saved, you have a ministry, and it's to reconcile souls unto Him. Amen. Be ye reconciled unto God. You go to them, hey, guess what? God's forgiven you. Do you want forgiveness? Amen. It's up to you. It's their choice. And He sent us to do the work for Him. In James 4, He says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. 
As we look for stability through our times, through the times of our life, and we consider that our entire life, God says, it's but a vapor. We have little time compared to eternity. Yeah. Our whole life is but a vapor. You see these people that smoke these stupid vape cigarettes and it disappears. And yet, 2018 is a drop in the bucket. If my whole life is a vapor that vanishes in seconds, then what's that one year represented? Is it a few molecules? Right? You think about just how small the next year really is in the big picture. And yet, how important and how big it can be if you lay a foundation now. Next year can be foundational for the rest of your life. You can say, this is it. I don't care. I'm not going back. I'm getting a hold of that plow and we're moving forward. Amen. I'm getting in that battle. I'm going to do what God wants. I'm willing to give up these things that have held me back for so long. And I personally dealt with this years ago where there were certain things that I kept struggling with and struggling with. And I look back in retrospect and I say, God, how did you ever get me out of that? How was I ever... And it's finally, finally I just said, you know what? I'm done. I'm tired. I kept thinking like, oh, I can keep a hold of this sin and still have a ministry of reconciliation. Guess what? It don't work that way. God wants a clean vessel. God wants a willing heart and a pure mind. He wants sobriety. He wants somebody that's willing to sacrifice their time and give it to Him. In Romans 13, look at verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. When he says the day is at hand here, he's not saying the rapture is at hand. right? He's not saying talking about the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying that the battle is at hand. Your ministry is at hand. Your time to step up to the plate and fulfill God's purpose for your life is now. It's at hand. Look, he's you know, and it's, it's we're not nervous for the end. He, oh no, what are we going to do? The end's nigh. No, it's not. It's not a nervousness for the end. He wants us to be stable for the fight, right? Because you think about it, when they gathered troops in the Old Testament, those that were afraid, they sent them home. Fear spreads, right? If you're afraid of going out soul winning then don't show up at a soul winning time. Right? I mean, come on. We need to have boldness. And Well, I don't know all the verses, but I want to go as a silent partner and do it boldly. Yeah. I'm going to learn. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to study. I'm going to get ready. I'm going to go. God needs warriors, and He wants us to be stable. He wants us to be straight across the line. And we have to... The only way to do that is through the wisdom and understanding and knowledge of God Amen. and how right. He operates. Look what He says in the next verse here. Romans 13, 13. He says, let us walk honestly. Remember I said it's about your talk and your walk. He says, let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Make not provision for the flesh. He said make provision for the Spirit, right? Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You think about what does it mean to make provision? Like if you're going camping, you're going to get your tent together and get your gas and your stove and your food. Right? If you're, you know, I make provision for coffee. I get it ground up. I mean, I put the filter in there. I get the water ready. I set the timer. I have made provision for coffee, right? I'm going to have coffee in the morning, right? Well, in the same way, what does the world, how do you make provision for the flesh? Well, I bought that big screen TV. Man, we got the surround sound. I got cable ordered. We got it hooked up. I got the DVR recording the show. Right, we just rented that latest Disney movie that's going to teach you to teach your kids to make friends with faggots. You know, we got it all right. That's that's making provision for the flesh, and that is not something we should do. God's warning against this. He's saying, don't go out and get ready. You know, I got the popcorn, and we're having everybody over for the ball game, and we got the lights. It's like, no, that's the flesh. Make provision for your spirit, for your new man to grow. Make provision for 2018 to say, I'm going to grow. And I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to get up an hour early because you know what? The Bible says that the Spirit gives life. Mm. Well, how could, man, I can't sacrifice another hour out of my day. Are you kidding? Hey, the Spirit will give life. Amen. That's what He says. I'm trusting in that. We're going to make it happen. That's good. Right? God's going to provide. Yeah. Look, you're in 
you're in 1 Corinthians 13. Let me read Colossians 4. He says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. He says, Walk in wisdom to them that are without. The people outside of the church, when they look at you, it ought to be okay, he's walking, he's trying to walk with God. They can make if they make fun of you and make faces at you and make threats at you, who cares? You walk with God. Let them know that there's a difference. Be distinct. And he says, let your speech be with grace. It's your walk and your talk is how we redeem the time. Yeah. That's how we find stability across all of our years. In verse, look at 1 Corinthians 3. Look at verse number 11. Of our salvation here, he says, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, let every man's work be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So he's saying here, once you're saved, you're in, right? You got that free ticket to heaven. So now what? Now what about your rewards? When you stand before the Lord, what's going to make it through? Holding the door for a little old lady may not make it through. Preaching the Gospel probably will. But I'm not going to stand here and say I understand everything about how God will judge. Because I know that when God... Because you look about how David, when he said that when some stayed with the stuff and others went to war, and, got, and he came back, he said that he rewarded everyone alike. Those that stayed and those that fought. So a mother that stays home with her children, when dad goes out soul winning, the mother will part alike. She's rewarded as a soul winner. It's a team effort, right? I can't do it by myself. I need my wife, yeah. right? I can't take care of the child. She has rewards. So we're, we're rewarded differently, but, but sometimes we have these, these very vain ideas about how to get a reward. About holding a door, trying to be nice, or great swelling words. And, and these are the world's ways of charity. You know, giving a dollar to a bum on the side of the road that refuses to work and wants to stay drunk. You think God's going to reward that? No, no He's not. He's, he's on the side of the road for a reason. It's because He's rejected God and His law. Amen. Look, He says, our, our work will be made manifest. When you stand before God, your work will be made manifest. He's going to see it. You're going to see it before Him. Are you going to be ashamed? You're going to be proud or you know, thankful. Yeah, God, I did that for you. I did it for you out of a sincere heart. That's what He sees. Not, oh, I did it to be seen of men. Because that's the way most people are. Yeah, Look, he says, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, so, yet so as by fire. He's saying as we pass through this, when our spirit leaves, when we go through into the spiritual realm, and we go to the judgment, some people will probably have no reward whatsoever. There are many Christians... They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're sealed unto the day of redemption. Man, they're saved. They've avoided hell. But they didn't do anything. And I'm not looking at a bunch of do-nothing Christians. I'm looking at people that want to be rewarded, that want to work for God. Amen. And I just want to encourage you and challenge you to consider your walk and talk. Consider what has happened the past year and look forward to this next year and say, what can I do better? How much more can I do for God? Look, he says, look at this, it's very important. He says in verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So, if somebody's looking for the temple of God, would they come to you based on how they see your temple? What he's saying is this body, this body we have has God's Holy Spirit in it. We have the ability to speak God's words when we read the Bible to Him. God's Holy Spirit will lead us into the truth and it will speak through us. But when somebody says, I'm looking for God, are they coming to you? Think about it. If they go to Google Maps and then it leads them to them, they'll be like, whoa, Google led me to the wrong person. This isn't the temple of God. Who is this guy? You know, he's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and a beer in his hand. Like, that's not the temple of God. And what God's saying here is for us to consider our actions and us to consider our lifestyle or our walk and our talk because the world sees it. And they're like, well, if that's God, I don't want anything to do with Him. We ought not to be hypocrites. Great preaching. Look, in, uh, turn to Philip. Actually, look at verse 17 here. It says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy 
For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Do you want God to destroy your body because you're in sin? Do you want God to destroy your body because you refuse to keep His commandments? Turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. If you're saved and living in sin against God's will, He may let the devil destroy your body. In 1 Corinthians 5, it says, "...to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved." He's like, when you kick somebody out of church, God will destroy their body. God, hey, okay, Satan, attack that body. Go ahead, get him. Tear that body down because they're living in sin. They refuse to get it right. And if it becomes a sin unto death, that's their choice. If they choose to let it go that far. As we look back at 2017, is it going to be said of you that you had great potential? Or that you did great things for God? And you think about that right now as you consider what you've accomplished this past year. And you think of, well, what, what could you have done? What kind of potential did you have? But then take that and move it across the line and say, well, moving forward, if God gave me such talent and potential for last year, how much more can He do with me next year? Let's stay focused on where we're going. What do you want out of 2018? You should have some personal goals. You should have some spiritual goals. And, and don't... Again, don't make them too big. Make it obtainable. You're in Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse number 27. He says, Only let your conversation, that's your walk and talk, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. As we walk into this new year, let's stand together for the gospel. Let's get some goals and focus together as a church to preach the gospel. Look in the next verse. He says, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. He's saying, your enemies, they're scared. They know their future. But you should not be terrified of anything. Hey, you should be stable at all times. Right? Turn, to, turn back to Isaiah chapter 33. They're afraid because they know they're lost. They're afraid because they know their destination. And, and that's evidence to us when we see that fear. But we're told nothing terrified. That's confidence in God with the times to come. Having stability. When you think about standing strong in a difficult time, I, you think of the David and Goliath, right? I mean, the little guy fighting the big guy, right? But David was strong. He wasn't afraid. Right. Goliath is out there. I mean, you know, in Goliath, you, you could say he pictures the devil or the world. You could say that Goliath pictures that old IFB movement, yeah. right, that mocks our soul winning yeah. and mocks the things that we're doing for the Lord. That's good. And you think about they, they're parading their champion around. That's what they did with Goliath. They literally paraded their champion around. Look at this guy. He's calling you out. He's saying names. He's saying you're, you know. And, and the weak were afraid. The weak were afraid. And yet David stood up as, as a small person and said, you know what? Who is this guy talking about God like that? He, he's nobody compared to my God. Right. And David was angry with the wicked. And we should have that same attitude. And you think about it because as the story developed, even David, he refused the king's armor. The king said, here's, here's the way that we've been fighting these battles. And David said, no, it don't feel right. This ain't right. It ain't working. Right? As a church, we don't go stand and hold signs on the corner. We don't just put tracks on doors and hope it works. We preach the Gospel. Amen. We use the tactics that are biblical and we reject seminary and tracting and street preaching and all these newfound ways that have taken people away from the Bible. Right. Away from the Word of God. Yes, instead, of, you know, instead of pastors raising up men that know how to preach, oh, well, let's just ship them off somewhere else. Hey, that armor doesn't work for us. Yeah. Right? Saul's armor was not fit for David. And in the same way, we're going to do it different. We're going to use methods that please God. Hey, we're going to have a mega marathon. We're going to have a soul winning marathon in every major city in America, in every state of America, and Lord willing, many other countries. Amen. That's different. That old IFB... That Goliath, they can't do that. Yeah, really they can't, can't touch that. They can't even comprehend it. No. Because nobody would support them. Right. We learn doctrines. 
We go door to door preaching. We're going to use the methods that please God. And you think about it, those five smooth stones have already been selected. I believe that first stone's up in the air. Right? After the tribulation is out and people are changing, right? They're seeing yeah. the, the lies of dispensationalism. And that stone's on its way. It's going through the air. And guess what? That giant's coming down. Right. Hey, and his head's coming off. But we have to stand firm. We have to get in this fight. Look, God wants to do a mighty work in Jacksonville in 2018. And we have to become stable at all times. We do it through His wisdom and His Word. Look at Isaiah 33, verse number 13. He says, Hear, ye that are far, far off, what I have done. And ye that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Think what he's saying here. Everlasting burning. Hey, how about us that we're saved? Right? The world can't. They're afraid. Hey, the hypocrites are scared to death. Fear is an evident token of their perdition. And yet we see these everlasting burning. Hey, the fire will try every man's work. Well, now that I recognize my work's going to be tried, I better get serious about it. I better get to work and do the right work and not waste my time with the, with the old world methods. Look at verse 15. He says, He that walketh righteously. This is what God's looking for. And speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppressions. You think about like the, the bankers and the wars and the Federal Reserve. I hate that stuff. Yeah. I despise the gain of oppressions. They go in and completely bomb a nation and set up their, their own new puppet government and their, and their own banks. Wicked. And it's through usury and oppression. I hate those things. This world is messed up. I can't fix that. Look, he says, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. Here, man, just take this. and No, no, no. Hey, get away from me. I don't want your bribe. Yeah. I'm going to stick with God, right? I'm going to speak uprightly. Look what he says. He says, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. God wants you to stop your ears from hearing blood. God wants you to stop your ears when somebody's wasting your time, when somebody's gossiping, when somebody's giving you some big tale. Well, let me explain. Nef hey, I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Don't tell me these stupid stories. You're wasting my time. Yeah. Look, he says, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. This is the righteous person God's looking for. Somebody that will shut their eyes from seeing evil. And like I said, I, I pick on the TV because that's an easy target, right? The same thing with Facebook. The same thing with YouTube. You're scrolling down, you see something. Oh, drunkenness. Oh, oh, nakedness. Are you going to shut your eyes? Are you going to close it? Are you going to turn it off? Or are you going to fall in the devil's trap? God wants you to stop your ears and shut your eyes and turn it off. Yeah, Don't be overcome by it. Look at verse 16. This person, right? He says, He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. God shall be given, I'm sorry, bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. Listen, there's salvation to those that trust in the Lord. Your works are going to be tried by fire. Not everything's going to make it through. Knowing this, we ought to walk and talk like things matter. Yes, like God matters. Like the Word matters. He wants us to separate us ourselves and walk with Him and not really care what other people think. Not really be worried if people make fun of you, call you names. Look at verse 22. This will be the last place we're looking at here. Isaiah 33, 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our King. He will save us. Right? There's three simple concepts here that give us a glimpse into the personality and the characteristics of God. You think about it, he's our, he's our judge. How will we be judged? Right? The Bible says we should judge ourselves, right? Well, judge yourself. How did you do in 2017? 1 to 10, where are you at? Are you 5? Are you 7? Judge yourself. Think about it. How well did I do for the Lord? If he's my judge, where would he put me? A 4? An 8? Consider it. How'd you do? You can improve in 2018. You need to have goals that you can measure yourself with. Yeah. You need to have goals that you can look back and compare with. You right. can do more. You can do better. We all can. Yes, sir. Look, He's our lawgiver. It says, how, how well do you know God's law? Consider this. If God's the lawgiver, He's given you the law. Now you have it. What are you going to do with it? Cool. Close the book. Stick it in your pocket. Put it on a shelf. Are you going to open up and read it? Are you Are going to commit it to your heart? Are you Are going to share it with other people? 
How well did you keep God's law in 2017? What laws do you need to work on? Consider these things as you look forward to the next year. And hey, I pray that the Lord would reveal to you the laws that you're breaking. Me too. I'm praying the Lord will reveal to me, Lord, where am I messing up? What laws have I neglected? Show them to me. Help me to get it right. And when those things come to your mind, man, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The first word out of your mouth, out in your heart, should be sorry. Forgive me. Help me to do better. He will. That's what He wants. But we have to decide to be obedient. It's our choice. Yeah. It says that He is our King. Are you fighting in His army? Or are you just fighting on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> are you just fighting with neighbors? Fighting with family? You know what I'm saying? If, if your family is not saved and you're arguing with them because they drink on the weekends, you miss the boat. Get them saved first. Then, then you know, otherwise you're picking the wrong fight. That's right. There was a guy that visited last week and he's talking about with his girlfriend. And well, she's got this and she wants to teach Sunday school and wait, 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 wait. Is she saved? Well, no. Get her saved. <laughs> Goal number one. Get her saved. Otherwise, the natural man cannot receive these spiritual things. That's right. Until somebody's saved, they can't understand these things. We need to understand what the fight of the Lord is. We're in his army, right? And you know, are we bringing his kingdom in? If he's a king, are we bringing his kingdom in for him? One door at a time? One soul at a time? Are we preaching the Gospel like we ought to? So look, I want to encourage you to make goals, but not to swear. This is a very important concept in the Bible. You can find it all throughout the Old and the New Testament is that we should not forswear ourselves. You should not say, I promise I'll never do... Lord, I, every single week I'm going to do... Whoa, 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 whoa. Be careful. Be careful. Yeah. Make your oaths honest before the Lord and keep your oaths before the Lord. He hates somebody that doesn't keep an oath. In James 5, he says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. As you make goals, keep it simple. Lord, I want to do this, whether I do or not. You know, I'm not swearing anything, but Lord, I want to. Will you help me? You know, keep it simple. And as a church, we have goals. We had a goal for 500 salvations this year. We're about to break 600. Lord willing, today we will break 600. I'd like to see that doubled. I'd like to see 1,200. Right? That's my goal for, for this church is 1,200 salvations in 2018. Hey, I'd like to see it tripled. I'd like to see 1,800, but we're not going to put that burden. We're just going to let's keep it simple. Lord, if you'll provide everything we need, if you keep the power on and keep us full of tracts and Bibles, we're going to go out and preach the gospel every chance you'll give us. And, Lord willing, we'll see 1,200 people saved next year. Amen. That's our goal as a church. Same thing with baptisms. Let's double them. And look, it says that God wants to make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. God wants you to be stable throughout all times. God wants you to be stable through 2018. Not a roller coaster. Hey, I know we're bouncing back from Christmas season and maybe financially things. Are, hey, just be stable. Just trust the Lord. Know that He can get you through it. And again, our stability in 2018, it comes from the wisdom and knowledge. It's our walk and our talk with God. Let's focus on that. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for this church. Thank You for everything that You've done here. Lord, we look forward to all the things that You're going to do next year. Lord, I just pray that You would give us a burden to have a heart for the lost souls. Lord, I pray You would help us to make righteous goals. Goals that we can obtain and we can live up to. And Lord, I ask also that You would help us to see our own sin and our own faults and give us the strength of salvation to overcome them. Lord, we love You and we thank You for everything You've given us. Thank You, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right.